Live from Vancouver, Canada, it's theCUBE. Covering OpenStack Summit North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the OpenStack Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back, I'm Stu Miniman with my co-host John Troyer, and you're watching theCUBE, the worldwide leader in tech coverage. Happy to welcome back to the program, longtime friend of theCUBE, back from the earliest days, Randy Bias, Vice President with Juniper. Randy, great to see you. Absolutely, great to be back. Love All right, you guys. So, so Randy, we, we've been talking about you know, community and everything's going good, and uh, attendance might be down a little bit, but how we fit in with containers and Kubernetes and everything, so we expect you to tear everything up for us and tell us the reality of what's happening in this community. <laughs> well, I'll do my best. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we get to the Kubernetes stuff, uh, you're working on, uh, we used to call it Open Contrail, uh, yes. which, which you were involved in before Juniper acquired it, uh, went through Correct. a rebranding recently. Uh, I think Tungsten, which uh, I, I was looking up, uh, came from the word heavy stone. So uh, let, let's give us the upward date from the networking side. Yeah, so uh, the short history is that there was a company called Contrail that created a software-defined networking controller. It was acquired by Juniper in 2012, 2013, uh, and then that was open sourced. So Juniper for a long time was running with sort of two additions, Contrail, which was the commercial offering, and Open Contrail, which is the open source. And then as I, at, shortly after I joined Juniper, I identified that you know, we really needed to go back to the drawing board on the way that we had organized the community and transition it from being Juniper-led to community-led. And so over the past year, I spearheaded that effort. And then that culminated in us announcing at the end of March at ONS that um, you know, Open Contra was now Tungsten Fabric. We renamed it, we moved it into the Linux Foundation under its governance. And now Juniper is one of many people of the community that have a seat at the table for the management, both from a business and technical perspective. And, uh, uh, we're moving forward uh, with a new reinvigorated community. Yeah, so networking sits at the, the really the intersection of this multi-cloud world that we're living in. Uh, there's, there's so many players trying to be there. You know, Cisco really moving to become more of a software company. When I interviewed their, their number two guy at their show, he's like, when you think of Cisco in the future, we're not even going to be a networking company, we'll be a software company. VMware, of course, pushed heavy through the, the Nacira acquisition. Where, where does Tungsten fit, to kind of compare and contrast for us where it fits against some of these other offerings uh, out there in the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, I think most enterprise vendors are in a similar transition from being hardware to software companies. You know, we're no different than any of the rest. I think we have a pretty significant advantage in that we have a lot of growth in the cloud sector, so a lot of the large public clouds are our customers and we're selling, selling a tr tr tremendous amount of hardware into them. So I think we've got a lot longer runway. Um, but you know, we just recently hired a CTO, Bakash Kohli, out of Google, and we're starting to see some additional folks out of Google, like my new boss, Morgan, and what that's bringing with it is a very much a software first type perspective. So Bakash and Morgan really built everything for the Google network from the top of rack all the way out to the WAN, and it's almost all software based, disaggregated hardware software, open source software running on top of white boxes. And so that, that kind of perspective is now really deep, start beginning to become embedded in Juniper. And at the head of that is Tungsten. So we see Tungsten Fabric as being sort of a tool that we use to create you know, a global ubiquitous network fabric that anybody can use anywhere without talking to Juniper at all, without knowing that Juniper is part of Tungsten. And then as they grow up and they get to a point where they need multi-cloud, they need federation, or they need kind of day two enterprise operations, you know, we have a commercial version, a commercial distribution that they can use. Randy, we, we talked a little bit about OpenCon Trail and last year at, at OpenStack Summit, moving it to a more of a community-based governance model. And now that, you know, that, that's happened now with the Linux Foundation. And can you talk a little bit about the, the role of open source governance and corporate governance and, the, and foundations and just going forward? How do you, you know, what's an effective model for 2018 going forward for, for a foundation-led project? And, and how, what should, you know, what, or, what it, or maybe in the context of Tungsten Fabric and how is that, that's looking? Yeah, so again, Open Control is now Tungsten Fabric. Yes. It might be new for some of the viewers. So a lot of people are still coming to terms with that. Um, so one of the things that we noticed is that um, when, when many people go and they say, hey, we want open source first, like the AT&Ts of this world, part of what they're saying, one of the aspects of, of being open source first is we want to be one of many around the table. We want to have a seat at the table, we want to have the option to contribute code back, and we want to feel like it's a group effort. 
And so that was a big factor, right? It was, it was an open source project, but it was largely the governance was carried by Juniper. All of the testing infrastructure was Juniper. You know, all of the people who made architectural decisions were Juniper. <laughs> all of the lead contributors were Juniper. And so going to Linux Foundation was critical to us having a legal framework where the trademarks, the code, the licenses, the contributor license agreements are all owned and operated by the Linux Foundation, not by Juniper. So we basically have a trusted third party who's, who can mediate all those things and, and create a structure, a governance small structure where Juniper has one seat at the table and all the other community members do as well. So it was really key to getting to, to moving to that model to, to create people, to increase people's interest in the project and to, and to really go to the next level. There just wasn't any way to do it without doing this. All right, so Randy, let, let's talk about OpenStack. Um, sure. You were watching the keynote yesterday. You were, uh, you know, in the Twitter stream. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't usually watch comments. keynotes, man. Um, but you, you know this community, so I do you know, know this community. <laughs> give us kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly from your standpoint as to you know where we've gone, uh, you know what's doing well, and what your frustrated as heck that we still haven't uh, you know fixed yet. Well, I mean, it's it's great that we have so much inroads amongst the carriers. It's great that you know um, that there's a segment that OpenStack has been able to land in. I mean. At some points when I was feeling particularly pessimistic on some days, I was like, oh man, this thing's never going to go anywhere. So, so that's great. On the other hand, you know, with the, the promise that we had of being sort of the Linux operating center, operating system of the data center, and you know, really getting inroads into private cloud and enterprise, that just hasn't materialized. And, and I don't see a path to that. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of that has to do with history. I'm not sure how much of, a, of it I want to go into here, but, um, you know, I, I see the, those as being bright lights. I see the Kata containers effort and sort of having this alternative uh, structure that's more like the umbrella structure that I lobbied for while I was on the board. Uh, so for several years on the board, I said we need to really look more like the Apache Software Foundation. We need to look less like the Linux operating system in terms of how we think about things, not this big integrated monolithic release. You need, you need more competition between pro projects and, and that just wasn't really embraced. And I think that that, in, in, in a way, that was one of uh, several things that really kind of limited our ability to capture the market that we really wanted, which is the enterprise market. Yeah, I, well I, I know, and one of, the, one of those sticking points there that I've talked to you many times over the years about is how do I actually deploy this? You know, getting a base configuration and scaling this out, uh, you know, simplicity is, is tough. You know, getting to those in environments, uh, you know, getting it up in two weeks, uh, you know, is good for some environments, but, but maybe not for others. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's sort of a spectrum, right? At one end of the spectrum, you say, hey, we're going to have a very opinionated approach like Kubernetes does, and we're going to limit what we say we can do. You know, we're not all things to all people. And I think that opinionated approach, like the Linux operating system, works very, very well. And then the other end of the spectrum is we've got no opinion like the Apache Software Foundation, and then it's up to vendors to go and t cherry pick the pieces they want and, and turn that into some kind of commercial offering, whether it's Hortonworks or Cloudera around Hadoop or, or whatever it is. The problem is, is that OpenStack wound up in the middle where it had this sort of integrated monolithic release cycle, which it still does, which tried to be all things to all people, and it was never as great as it could be. So it's like we got to support Hyper-V and we got to support VMware and we got to, and, and as, the li, as the laundry list of all the things we have to support grew longer, it became more and more difficult to have a compelling, easy to use, easy to scale offering that any enterprise could consume. Randy, a lot of talk this week about edge computing, whatever, and with several different definitions, right? But it does strike me that you know there's a certain set of apps that, that you write them and that they, they, they live fine in a big public cloud, in a big data center somewhere. That's but right. there's a lot of hardware that's going to be living out in the world, whether that's at the base of a, of a radio tower or in a wall or in my shoe, that is going to be running hardware and is going to be running something and sometimes that something can be OpenStack, and we're seeing some examples of it, many examples of that already. Is that an area of growth for OpenStack? Is that an interesting part of, of, of how this fabric is going to expand? Well, I probably have a contrarian view here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I spent a bunch of time at Juniper. One of the things I worked on for a while was edge computing, and we're still trying to decide what we want to do there. And you know, kind of to the, the first point you made is, 
everybody's edge is different, <laughs> right? Is it on the mobile phone? Is it back in, in the data center? And the difference is between, the difference is that the real estate gets more expensive as you move out, right? And it's in terms of latency, and it's in terms of bandwidth, and it's also in terms of the cost of storage and compute. As you move closer to the mobile device, it becomes progressively more expensive. And so that's why a lot of people sort of look and say, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we can get you out there closer, lower latency and bandwidth and so on. But as we looked at it, a lot of the different use cases, it became really interesting in that it wasn't clear if there was that much value between five milliseconds and 20 milliseconds, right? I mean, that's pretty, either one's pretty close. Sure, there's a lot of difference between 20 and 100, but maybe not so much between five and 20. And so we kind of came to the conclusion that at least for right now, probably the bulk of use cases are fine with 20 milliseconds. And what that means is that regional, regional systems like AWS's Lambda at the edge that are in Metro, those are probably good for most cases. I don't know that you need to be on the, on the tower. I don't know that you need to be in the central office. So I think edge computing is still nascent. We don't know exactly what all those use cases are, but I think you might be able to service most of them from regional data centers. And then the question really becomes, uh, what does that stack need to be? And if you have a regional data center that's got plenty of power, plenty of space, then it might be that OpenStack is a good solution. But if you're trying to scale down onto the tower, I got to have some doubts about whether OpenStack can really scale down that far. Yeah, Randy, uh, analytics is something we've been seeing the networking people use for, for many years at this show. Uh, starting to hear a lot of discussion about AI and ML. I'd love your viewpoint as to what you're seeing in that space. I, you know, I have some friends who um, started off on AI in very early days and he had a very pessimistic view. He said, uh, you know, this stuff comes and goes. But I'm, I'm actually very positive and optimistic about it because the way I look at this is there's a renaissance happening, which is that, you know, now ML is really available to the masses and you're seeing people do really interesting things like we have a, a product called AppFormix and what they do is they take ML and they apply it to operations and I love this because as an operations guy, you know, I used to have these problems in production where something would go out and the first thing I do is I'm start trying to do uh, correlation and then root cause analysis, like what was the actual failure? Like I can see the symptom on this end and I have to get all the way back to what caused it. And the reality is that machine learning, AI uh, techniques and protocols can do all that heavy lifting for operators very, very quickly and basically surface a problem for somebody to, to do the final analysis on. And so I do think that ML and AI applied to very specific vertical problems is just a, a place where we're going to see a tremendous amount of revolution in, in, the, next, in the next couple years. All right, and, and that hits right at uh, really that intersection between kind of the developers and the operators there. Absolutely. Uh, what, what, what are you seeing uh, for, from an organizational standpoint, companies you're talking to these days, how are they doing uh, adopting that change, dealing with that, uh, you know, often schism or are they bringing those groups together? Well, I, I, think, I think you remember uh, that like in the early days I used to bring my deck along and I would talk about assembly line IT versus the robotics factory model of IT and I would sort of you know, make that sort of uh, uh, analogy to sort of the car manufacturing process. And I think what machine learning is really going to do is, is take us to that next level past that, right? So we, we had the assembly line, we have all the specialists, we had the robotics factory where we had the people who know how to build the robots and the software and it's really sort of like just turning out with a lot of people on the line. And I think the next level after that is you know completely fully automated you know applications driving themselves you know self-driving applications and I think that's when things get really interesting and maybe we start to remove the the traditional operator out of the equation and it really becomes about empowering developers with tools that are are comfortable and that leverage all the cloud era stuff that we built. All right, so, so Randy, you're credited with the pets versus cattle analogy. Um, what's the latest? You're talking about some of the previous slide decks. Uh, what's Randy Bias looking on down the road? I mean, this stuff just comes to me, man. I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't, I can't like predict, but um, the thing I've been talking about a lot lately is services as a platform. I think we might have talked about that last time, which is just this notion that you know, if you, we look at where Amazon's invested and what's interesting, it's really not the infrastructure layer and it's really not the PaaS layer, it's that thick layer in between with like database as a service and NoSQL as a service and messaging as a service and DNS and so on, where you can you know, kind of cherry pick those things as you're assembling your own PaaS for your application. And I still think that's an area that is under discussed and the reason is, is that people back into basically doing that, building kind of the services as a platform system, but they're not like you know, going into it kind of like eyes wide open. 
yeah, you know, so just following up on that, that, that last piece, one of the criticisms I have this week is when you talk about multi-cloud, most of the people talk about, oh, well, people are clawing things back to their data centers. Juniper plays across the board, strong partnership with Amazon, you're here. What are you hearing from customers? You know, what is, the, what do you see as kind of the balance there and, you know, the, the public cloud's role in the world? I mean, they're still winning, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't think there's any doubt. I haven't seen the client back here talking about, but we are starting to enter into the era of, okay, the stuff is out there and it's running, but I need to apply my governance model, I need to understand who's using what, I need to understand what it's costing me, and that's the sign of the, of the maturation process. And so I think that, that you know, we saw in the early days of cloud, people jump in the gun, you know, creating compliance services and you know, uh, 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 SaaS products that would basically measure how much you're spending, and I think that, that is, it's time for that stuff to come back in vogue again, because the tooling needs to be there for people to manage these extended supply chain of IT vendors, which include the public cloud, um, and I think that you know the idea that we claw them back as opposed to like just see that as a holistic part of what we're trying to accomplish doesn't make any sense. Oh, all right. Well, Randy Bias, always a pleasure to catch up it's with good. you. John. For John Troyer, I'm Stu Miniman. Getting towards the end of two days of three days of live coverage. Thanks for staying with theCUBE. <laughs>